Okay, so graveyard poetry is a specific thing, but it's also part of a general tendency in, I'll just call it Western literature, uh, because it goes back to uh, Roman times. Um, there's this Latin phrase, memento mori, essentially, remember you will die. And, uh, you know, centurions used to kind of remind this, remind themselves of this phrase before they would go into battle. Uh, and in a strange sense, it, what on one level might seem like some not very optimistic thing to be telling yourself before you go into battle, <clears throat> there's also a way in which all, it's also consoling because everyone will die, right? So not necessarily you will die at this particular battle because we're gonna lose, but hey, everyone's gonna die and we could still win the battle, but you, do, you might yourself die at this battle. So, you know, face it, you're gonna have to face it one way or another. And um, there's a whole tradition of this phrase, even after Roman times that kind of wove its way through symbolism in art and in poetry um, throughout uh, the Renaissance. Um, you would see like this skull right here, coming from the Renaissance and the skull was sometimes placed on the artist's desk or the poet's desk or someone's, you know, prominently in their room to remind them that they will die. Uh, and it's supposed to be used as a spurn to creativity or to action or to reprioritizing your perspectives, right? Because if you know you're gonna die, you're not gonna let trivial things bother you too much. Uh, you're going to try to do what's important in life at every given moment, moment because life is fleeting. So it's that reminder that life is fleeting. And it's pretty obvious that that is kind of, it carries over into the idea of being in a graveyard uh, and reminding yourself of this very simple fact of life, which is the end of life, death. Uh, it appears famously in Hamlet, uh, the famous scene where Hamlet kind of digs up Yarick's skull, who is the king's gesture, jester. Um, and so it's, it's quite a poignant moment and an antithetical moment because at the, on the one hand, Yorick is a, a, a jester full of life, full of jokes, full of merriment. And yet here he is now, you know, food for worms rotting in the grave. And so Hamlet has this moment of introspection and he delivers a famous soliloquy looking at Yorick's skull. So that's a memento mori moment in Shakespeare. Okay, uh, another graveyard poetry origin is actually in the enlightenment. Uh, and it is a bridge between the enlightenment and romanticism and in a lot of very kind of complicated ways. Precursors are some of the ways that enlight the enlightenment got going, both gave rise to um, graveyard poetry and its influencers. And uh, graveyard poetry was a way that for some shortcomings within, within the enlightenment, some perceived shortcomings in the enlightenment movement uh, were addressed and then taken up later uh, as the romantic movement. So it's a bridge between these two movements. And one of them is more of a, like almost a scientific or philosophical movement. Romanticism, that's the, the former, the latter romanticism is also a philosophical movement and it's a reaction to science. It's almost not an anti-science movement, but it's certainly, uh, as you probably already know, if you've taken a few classes uh, in this course, um, it's a response to the scientific uh, revolution, industrial re revolution, and it shows or tries to respond to some what are seen as inadequacies or shortcomings within the prior movements. Okay, so as far as the lecture today, our timeline, we're going to start out um, with Thomas Parnell, who's the first uh, uh, graveyard poet. Um, I guess you could say, although he had predecessors and we'll talk about those. And then we're going to actually end with uh, Percy Shelley's Ozymandias, uh, which is not on our course reading list, but it, it's very short. So, you know, I'm just adding this in, but it's a great bookmark because it shows kind of how graveyard poetry was taken up and springboarded into the romantic movement. So some, some of the elements of the graveyard poetry is taken up by Shelley 
and I, at the at the outset, when we look at Ozymandias, we're actually going to look at Ozymandias first. So we're going to kind of start at the end, and then you'll be able to track how you got there by looking at the, the uh, preceding poets to Shelley. Okay. I met a traveler from an antique. Can you guys hear that? Okay. Who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Okay, so we're just going to look at it for just a second um, uh, without the video. Um, the poem is interesting because it's a hearsay poem. It's a, a traveler is telling the author or the, the initial narrator. There's kind of a secondary narrator, so it's framed. Uh, I met a traveler who's told me this. Uh, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert, near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies. What's a visage? It's a face, right. Um, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well, those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. So do I have any volunteers to kind of tell me how uh, these last five lines uh, culminate in some kind of sense that Shelley's trying to convey in the within the uh, graveyard poetry genre, from what we've seen of great graveyard poetry so far, Does anyone, any volunteers? Okay, Paul. Yeah, I have a tendency to talk a lot, so. Oh no, go ahead. Try to kind of keep back, but um, I, re I really like how the last couple lines overturn everything, and it and it really emphasizes the irony of his. A statement where it's look at my works he mighty and despair and his works are the collapsing empire or his collapsed thing so um yeah so I, I like the overturn and that juxtaposition how much it stresses the irony of that quote right right so here is probably one of the most powerful people of his age um and not only that but one who had the had the means to create this monument to themselves and what why would someone create a giant monument to themselves and their power? Why? Why do people do that? So that they would live forever, something they've done that would endure. Right, so you know, you, you're, you're powerful in your day while you're alive, but one way to kind of remain powerful after your death is to create a giant monument to yourself, whether it's a super highway or a library or a giant, you know, statue in the middle of the desert. And even that, obviously, in this case, was not sufficient to ward off the ravages of time. So as badass as he thought he was, he still couldn't, uh, you know, he couldn't uh, militate against reality, to time, uh, the, you know, erosion, physical processes. Uh, so everyone, no matter who you are, will have this done to them on one, in one level or another. 
And so po graveyard poetry is this is showing us that in the grand scheme of things, there will be this ultimate leveling uh, that someone like Ozymandias and a pauper will both be dust and no matter what kind of monument you create, it will eventually erode into nothing. And it, it's almost extra poignant for someone like Ozymandias because uh, he had the audacity to, to think he could uh, outlive time or, or kind of trick time into letting him slide and, and live on into immortality. Whereas the pauper probably knows full well that he's food for worms. So Ozymandias is, is kind of, uh, he has a bit of um, pride. Yeah, he's got, he's like overweening pride. Um, okay, so that's Ozymandias. And I think let's go back and look at Thomas Parnell, who's like the, the bookmark on the other end, the early end of the graveyard po poetry that we're looking at. Anglo-Irish poet, those are his dates. And he had some literary friends. He was within a li literary group or club called the Scribblerus Club, and they were quite famous. Uh, they all met in salons. They were uh, kind of famous for the Augustan age of poetry. Their work include, included a lot of satire. They were into wit, witty turns of phrase and satire. There was a um, kind of a similar group or similar groups in Paris at the time. We're actually gonna look at the, we're gonna kind of dive into the poetry itself um, because you know we're doing these, these things virtually. Uh, I would, I like to be in a class where we have discussions about poetry. So stop me, I'm gonna kind of read a few things, talk about it, ask you a few things um, and please feel, feel free to participate and chime in so we can really kind of like zoom in uh, closely to, to some of this work. Okay, so here's a night piece on death. By the blue taper's trembling light, no more I waste the wakeful night, intent with endless view to pour the schoolmen and the sages o'er, their books from wisdom widely stray, or point at best the longest way. I, I'll seek a readier path and go where wisdom's surely taught below. Okay, so as expected, when you first kind of, die, and I, I always have this, it's not a problem, but it's just a reality. When you dive into this kind of Augustan verse, it's quite striking at first that because it's not, um, you know, it's a little bit strange to our ear. It takes a while to get used to it. You have to acclimate to it. Um, but I wanna point, your, point you to these, these lines in red. With endless view to pour the schoolmen men and the sages or their books from wisdom widely stray or point at best the longest way. Um, what's he talking about? Uh, give me the setting and how he's going to set up a contrast in this very intro introductory uh, paragraph or stanza. Yes. Well, I took uh, it that, um, like he's sitting inside he's reading all of these like widely acknowledged, knowledgeable, I'm thinking like philosophies and theories and meanings of life and things like that. And all of these like renowned texts. And he's thinking like, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. that they, they're using a lot of language to convey something that's very simple. Right, they, maybe they fall short on some basic things. Mm -hmm. um, good, good. I think that's exactly true. Anyone else want to chime in on, on this first bit here? I, I kind of want to add on to Krista. It, it, it's just like this like over intellectualism of academics where they sometimes reduce something. And, and Parnell seems to be, you know, it, it is like a very romantic sentiment. <clears throat> like you have to go out there and like live it to experience it. So he's like, I'm gonna walk amongst the graves and I'm gonna see what the aesthetics and all the visual external elements bring to me. And I will learn something that I cannot even speak in because it is like kind of beyond just written language. It's something you kind of have to feel and express and it's ethereal and sublime. Right, right, good. I mean, um, does anyone else wanna chime in? Okay. Um, you have a tradition of this kind of sentiment 
in poetry. Uh, um, I'm thinking Dr. Faustus, who is the seeker of knowledge and he's pouring over his books late at night and the tapers, the candles are burning and he's just going over his books, just searching for all kinds of occult forbidden knowledge, the knowledge of the universe. And he just has this thirst and this lust for knowledge. Uh, so that's Goethe's poem. It's a, a kind of a tradition in literature, uh, Dr. Faustus, but that's seen as problematic. He kind of makes a pact with the devil. So there's this ongoing sentiment in a lot of poetry where, you know, that all this knowledge and science is fine and it's brought us a lot, but it's, it always misses kind of the most basic things like uh, Krista said. Um, and of course, this is very appropriate for the time because this is the age of Newton and of enlightenment empiricism, huge, discoveries in science about gravity and about the orbits of the stars and everything. And so you can just lose yourself in all this new science, all this new knowledge. But he doesn't want to do that. He wants to go to uh, the place where wisdom's taught below, where a deeper wisdom, a readier path. Um, so yeah, okay. Uh, I'll seek a readier path and go to where wisdom's surely taught below and at the bottom the left presents a place of grave. So he goes to the graveyard. Okay. That steeple guides thy doubtful sight among the livid gleams of night. There pass with melancholy state by all the seldom of the solemn heaps of fate and think as softly sad you tread above the venerable dead. This is interesting because he, he actually changes the narratival perspective, because in this first bit, it's I, he's talking first person. And then he does this strange second person commanding voice, you. Uh, but there's also places where he says we. So he's kind of telling the reader to go here, but he's, you know, he knows he's kind of guiding the reader here. So it's I, you, and we, it's all kind of strangely jumbled up. And I think that might add to the, the sense in which you know, our, our humanity is kind of emphasized by this, this site of great graveyards. Okay. Uh, time was like thee, they life possessed, and time shall be that thou shall rest. The marble tombs that rise on high, whose dead in vaulted arches lie, whose pillars swell with sculptured stones, arms, angels, epitaphs, and, bo epitaphs and bones, these, all the poor remains of state, adorn the rich or praise the great. Okay, so this is, I won't even finish that sentence. Um, this is a discussion of kind of Ozymandian sentiments or desires to praise the great, to, uh, to with pomp and ceremony and monuments, kind of show how great and wonderful you were in life. And once again, um, it's once again, this is shown to be insufficient, okay? And it's a little bit complicated actually. And if you read too fast, you'll miss it because there's these two they's in the last two lines, the in fame they, live are senseless of the fame they give. Those two they's are actually referring to different things. So I, I tried to show you by coloring them that the they in pink here is a reference to the rich or the great. And the they in yellow is they being the pillars, the sculptured stones, the arms, the angels, the epitaphs, okay? So they uh, were famous on life, but they now, because they're dead, are senseless of the fame that these things they wrought, these uh, monuments, they're senseless of those things, uh, the, the fame that they give. So they, it doesn't do them any good. Okay, uh, Paul, did you have a question? Yeah, first of all, that's really cool. I didn't notice it because like the, the using the same word brings them together. But um, how much are are these people criticizing or responding to um, like any like political corruption or things that they particularly saw in their time? 
you know, kind of like Voltaire was directly addressing people and, you know, commenting and sat satirizing some political corruption. And, and I've noticed like this theme of like, oh, well, they're wealthy, they're going to die anyways, or they're rich, they're going to die anyways. Um, so how much like do these graveyard poets respond directly to like political corruption or political issues that are happening right now at that time? Well, um, I know that Pope was uh, very engaged. In fact, all these people, these people, these first few like Pope and Parnell were satir satirists. And what do you do when you're a satirist? You usually satirize your, you know, your friends and your enemies and your frenemies and all the people in your age who you have a bone to pick with and issues with. Uh, and I know they did that. And I'm, in fact, I mean, I think we might've read this already. Famously, Pope uh, would, you know, write a poem and, and, you know, use a pseudonym so that when all his enemies praise the poem in the press, uh, he'd be like, oh, that's actually me and I'm your enemy. So you're praising your enemy. You didn't even know it was me. And so, I mean, there is this funny game um, and I don't know if there's any modern day parallels, but uh, yeah, there, it was quite, uh, quite a, um, a, a bit of skirmish, a bit of Perry and Dodge uh, in the literary scene. Um, I, was, I was thinking of like William Butler Yeats because he went from like really focusing on the artistry of poetry and this like whole historical relevance and then he started to become much more political with this poetry and responding directly to some of the turmoil between Ireland and England so uh, right. that's why I'm kind of asking and and you answered my question so I yeah yeah it. I mean I think that's pretty normal uh, for for a lot of people uh, and and poets too because they they're young when they're young they're, they just care about like you know, amorous poetry to their girlfriends or whatever. And as they get older and they realize kind of about more of the wider world, they get involved, involved. I think older people tend to get, maybe write more political poetry. I mean, I think that's kind of the case, but I'm not entirely sure, but anyway. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on. Sorry, there's kind of a lot to go through. Okay, um, so what's Cynthia, the moon? Uh, so, ha, while, I gaze, pale Cynthia fades, the bursting earth unveils the shades. What are shades? Shades is an old word for what? Kind of ghosts. A, ghosts, right. It's an important word to know when you're reading poetry from this period. Shades are ghosts. Uh, all slow and wan and wrapped with shrouds. They rise in visionary crowds and all with sober uh, accent cry, think mortal what it is to die. When men my scythe and darts, this is like a grim reaper figure. When men my scythe and darts supply, how great a king of fears am I. They view me like the last of things they make and then they dread my stings. Death's but a path that must be trod if man would ever pass to God. A port of calms, a state of ease, the rough rage of swelling seas. So I kind of skipped over, but there's an ellipse here um, where uh, what is, Parnell is doing is he's starting out with uh, death being this grim reaper, scary figure, but death is actually here trying to, or these shades, this ghost, are trying to console the would-be dire and say, to say like, hey, look, I know it's kind of scary, but if you want to get to God, you go through death. And so don't worry about it. Um, so when you die, you eventually get to such joy, though far transcending sense, have pious souls at parting hence. So when you die, it's, uh, you'll have joy. On earth and in, the and in the body placed, a few and evil years they waste. But when their chains are cast aside, See the glad scene unfolding wide, clap the glad wing and tower away and mingle with the blaze of day. So you become not a scary ghost, but like a beautiful angel and you ascend to the sky. So what's the difference then? You have a similarity between Parnell here and Ozymandias by Shelley. They both show how these uh, kind of monuments are a waste of time and ultimately no good and that there is this great leveling. But what does Parnell here have that Ozymandias totally lacks? Anyone? Reference to an afterlife? Right, 
Right, and therefore maybe a little op a little optimism, a little hope. Uh, you know, not to comment on Shelley's like theology or anything, but uh, in Ozymandias anyway, it's just an empty desert and there's nothing left for you. Uh, no matter what you do, no matter how great you are, it's just emptiness. There's no sense in which, oh, it's okay, Ozymandias, you will send it into heaven and you're in a better place now. So that there is a, a bit of uh, optimism here. And you, you will see this kind of strange relationship with optimism that graveyard poetry has, which is ironic. And we'll see that maybe in a, in a little bit. Let's look at Alexander Pope. Oh, 6.30 already. Oh my gosh, it's taking forever. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm just going to quickly uh, go through this. this. Some of the stuff is like biographical stuff that you can search up on your own. Uh, he was a big fan of um, Newton, and that's really important for Pope, okay? And it's actually one of the ways in which it explains a lot of Pope, and it explains a lot of later poets' problems with Pope. Um, as great as Newton was, I'm not ba bashing Newton, uh, but like I said before, the poets that came after Newton uh, needed something more, and I will show you why, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, Awake my St. John and leave all meaner things to low ambition and the pride of kings. Let us, since life can little more supply than just to look about us and to die, expatiate freer over this, or this scene of, of man, a mighty maze, but not without a plan. So this plan is going to be his main theme. A wild where weeds and flowers promiscuous, promiscuous shoot or garden tempting with forbidden fruit. Together let us beat the sample field, try what the open, what the covert yield. The latent tracts, the giddy heights explore. Of all who blindly creep or sightless soar, I nature's walks, shoot folly as it flies and catch the manners living as they rise. Laugh where we must, be candid where we can, but vindicate the ways of God to man. And this is a directly lifted from Paradise Lost by Milton. Um, both of them had a plan to justify, in Milton's terms, justify the ways of God to man or vindicate the ways of God to man, explain. Um, observe how system into system runs, what other planets circle other suns. Now this is actually kind of cool, I think, um, because it's talking about planets circling other suns. Why is that maybe interesting that other planets circle other suns if you know anything about the history of science? I know I might be getting a little bit off the beaten track, but I think I'll be able to bring this back and make it relevant. Um, was there a long history? Is, how far back does that idea go that other planets circle other suns? I think Aristotle was one of the people that argued that everything circled around the earth. I think he argued for a geocentric universe. If I remember right, I, I had an astronomy teacher that hated Aristotle. That's all I remember from like 10 okay. years ago. Yeah. Anyone else want to chime in on, on this question? Um, so it might have started with Aristotle. Other Greek scientists had theories about the way the universe was mapped out. But wherever it originated, the idea that all things circled around the earth was like the main theory of astronomy way up until Galileo uh, and Copernicus. It was like the Copernican turn where Copernicus said, hey, we're not, everything's not circling around the earth. Uh, we're actually circling around the sun. And as normal as that sounds to us, uh, it was totally off the wall and it really kind of hurt people's heads to think about for a long time. And especially if you were like high up in the Catholic church, because it was like doctrine that the earth was the center and everything revolved around the earth. So when Copernicus and then Galileo said, look, we're, we're, we're now looking with our empirical data that we're getting through our telescopes, we're seeing there's Jupiter over there. And Galileo saw that Jupiter had some moons with some circles with which were orbiting Jupiter. Um, and in fact, uh, over here on this second uh, stanza, um, Pope 
mentions Jove's satellites are less than Jove, Jove being Jupiter. Okay, it's the ancient Roman uh, god, but also the planet Jupiter. So that Jove's satellites are less than Jove. There's, so if, you're, if you've got something out there in the solar system that's being circled by other heavenly bodies, namely Jupiter's moons, then, then suddenly the earth isn't the center of things, not the center of everything. Uh, other things, there are other centers. So it really decentralized the universe, this new science, much to the chagrin of, of some people who had a more religious or an older way of viewing the world. So here's, um, so that's kind of ironic because here's Pope who is kind of, he has a religious fundamental kind of pro-God uh, thesis here, but he's using these findings that in about a century or two prior were, were antithetical to Christian theology. So he's using new science to actually prove a, a kind of a, a system in which God is in charge. So it's a little bit complicated, but I think if anyone, Pope will make sense of it. All right. Um, now would this man upward, now upward he will soar and little less than angel would he would be more. So he's describing a situation where a man wants to be more than he is. Now looking downwards, just as grieved appears to want the strength of bulls, the fur of bears. It's a strange thing. Like he wants to be an angel because he's, he's envious of the angel's wings or immortality or whatever. But he also looks downward in this great chain of being. He looks downward at the, the beasts that are you know, allegedly beneath him in the chain of being. And he wants to have their virtues as well. He wants the strength of bulls, the fur of bears made for his use. All creatures, if he calls, say what their use had he. So what would these animals that he kind of uses, he kills the bear, puts the, the fur on himself, right? What use would he have of the bear if he had his own fur naturally, like it's growing out of his body, I know. Nature to these without profusion kind, the proper organs, proper powers assigned, each seeming want compensated, of course, here with degrees of swiftness there of force, all in exact proportion to the state, nothing to add and nothing to abate, each beast, each insect, happy in its own. Is heaven unkind to man and man alone? Shall he alone, whom rational we call, be pleased with nothing, if not blessed with all? So if man is not blessed with like the wings of a bird and the swiftness of a cheetah and the fur of a bear, uh, he's not gonna be, he's not gonna be happy. So uh, Pope is saying, you know, man, you're positioned right at the midpoint. Um, actually, if you see this arrow, he's midway between like non-being and God. So Pope, we're, we're kind of running out of time. I'm gonna speed up just a little bit. So Pope describes this vast chain of being, okay, from which God began. And at the bottom is there's like the insects and at the top is God. And man is kind of the, the happy medium between the two. And Pope is saying he should be happy with where he is. Everything's kind of part of this great chain of being plan. God has kind of taken care of everything. Man doesn't have to uh, complain or strive even. And this ends with this maxim at the very end of uh, the essay on man, one truth is clear, whatever is, is right. So if you do believe that God has kind of created this great chain of being, then it kind of removes your ability to complain about it because your lot in life is assigned by God. You're right where you ought to be. There's no going up, there's no going down. There's just, you know, you're at, you're at your uh, stasis moment between these various uh, degrees of being and it's all preordained. And when Newton was figuring out his laws of gravity, it all quite, it, it, suddenly when he released his Principia, he, it like harmonized all these strange forces and it Newton was able to articulate how the universe operated in a very like 
clear and simple, almost a, a beautifully simple way. And some people took that as like, well, I mean, it was scientific law and it, it answered a lot of questions and you could see why it was, it was such a big breakthrough. Um, but maybe it didn't solve all problems. Um, people have argued that one of the reasons that Pope adopted such a, um, it, it, there's a word for this attitude, it's called panglossia. It goes back to Leibniz, uh, German philosopher Leibniz, who basically said, you know, whatever, whatever is, is good. Uh, you, can't, you can't argue with the way the cookie has crumbled in your life. Uh, so some people have said that, you know, Pope, who had a lot of medical problems, that this is some kind of cope, that this was him saying, well, you know, I can't complain. I, I, it, it, is, it is what it is. Whatever is, is must be good, even though I'm, you know, you know, have all these medical problems. I have a, a hunchback and all this stuff and people made fun of him for it. So um, anyway, so just a quick ch changing of gears. I, I'm trying to push this a little bit faster than I would like, but this idea of this, um, this optimism that was brought about by this panglossia that Pope articulated where everything that is, is good. So we should all be just happy. Uh, it came about right at this time um, of Baroque painting, which show these bucolic scenes of perfection where nature is good and nature is bountiful and nature is plentiful. And what, does, what can humans do but just be there to reap the reward and the benefit of living in this perfect nature, okay? Uh, as you, there's a, a bit of a theme here going with the, the paintings of this period, the mid 18th century. Uh, you could see a lot of these are French and it's, this style is mainly a French style. Uh, and it's also mainly tied to the ancien regime of the Louis, the, you know, the, the Louis, the, king, the kings of the period. Um, but I think it was like kind of a, a visual representation of this panglossy of this optimism where nature is good and it's there for, for us and, um, and why not just enjoy it. Now, the problem with that for the artist and the poet is the artist can't be happy. <laughs> the poet can't just be satisfied with, you know, happy days and everything's solved. Uh, Newton has solved all the questions. He's answered all the questions and God has mapped it all out to perfection. And there's no place for the inquisitive mind or the, the poetic uh, melancholy. Because uh, the, 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 a person wants to give voice to concerns, to his feelings of, you know, inadequacy, his rejection and love, his, you know, things that happen, death. He, he wants to give voice to these things. And if people are just telling him, hey, just be cool with everything and, and panglossia, man, haven't you heard? Everything's okay. Uh, the, the, the graveyard poet, the, the um, Gothic poet and the romantic poet and artist, they're going to start at some point to militate against this kind of scene that we see. And they did. So, um, that's how we get into the melancholy of Thomas Wharton, who specifically rebutted this kind of imagery in his poem, which is from the same. So this is, sorry, um, that's 1747, right? Francois Boucher and 1747, the pleasures of melancholy, which depicts a, a Francois Boucher scene, the laughing scenes of Purple Spring where all the wanton train of smiles and graces seem to lead the dance in sportive round while from their hands they shower ambrosial blooms and flowers, no longer charm Tempe, no more I court thy balmy breeze, adieu, green veils, ye broidered meads, adieu. So he's saying goodbye to all that, all that bucolia, all that bucolic flowers and fat cherubs uh, all that imagery that was just 
permeating the artistic sensibilities of the period. And he's uh, so he's kind of rejecting that. Uh, and he turns instead to beneath yon ruined abbey's moss grown piles. Oh, let me sit at twilight hour of eve, where through some western window the pale moon pours her long leveled rule of streaming light, while sudden sacred silence reigns around, save the lone screech owl's note. So this is darker, kind of more gothic imagery. Um, but, and it's not just an aesthetic choice, right? It's, there's a, there's almost a, pol a political revolution behind it in the sense that, you know, we can't just, we can't just maintain that everything's being solved by the, the ancient regime, the, but, but the, the people in charge, uh, whether it's God or Newton or King Louis XIV, um, we want our voice too. And so the way the, those poets articulated that voice was through this darker imagery and as Parnell said, that this was not a learned, uh, you didn't need to have a book. You didn't need to know, you didn't need to read Newton to understand what the graveyard would teach you. Okay, and that's their point with, with graveyard poetry. I just had like an obvious epiphany. There's yes. literally a character named Pangloss in Voltaire or Candide. I'm sorry, yeah, I should have mentioned uh, explicitly, it's very good of you to mention, um, uh, Voltaire's Candide was a direct refutation of Leibniz and this idea that whatever, whatever happens is, is the good thing to happen. So Candide goes around and have, has all these mishaps and stuff, so he can't, um, so he's kind of satirizing uh, that. So in a, in a weird way, Candide is kind of like alongside uh, an ally as it were, I'm sorry, uh, Voltaire is an ally as it were of these, this kind of romantic movement, these graveyard poets uh, in, their, in his rejection of uh, Popian um, Panglossia or Leibnizium. Pan yeah, I don't want to say much, but like he has a really interesting ending to, uh, to Candide too, because it's just, let's just cultivate our gardens. And it, it, it's almost like with this graveyard poetry, it's like, okay, let's cultivate the graveyard or something like that, I don't know. But, yeah, you know. I, it's been so long. Didn't he see a, like um, a Portuguese earthquake or something like that in Candida? Every single woman in Millions that, of people, or thousands it, of people died. And it's so, like, okay. I, I don't know Voltaire's actual background, but I, I know just like through Candide, the, the actual book, it's just like, it's so many horrors on every page. Every character is raped or murdered or tortured. Right, and it's, right. at the end, it's like, let's just cultivate our gardens. Right, right. So that yeah. so Voltaire is known as a satirist. And I think he was also a very politically motivated person too. So he's right up there in the same trajectory, I, I think. Um, so one more thing with this Wharton poem, The Pleasures of Melancholy. Um, this is a, a photograph of the pomp of the, the Russian imperial court right at the time uh, that Warden would be writing The Pleasures of Melancholy. And so this, um, her name was uh, Empress Elizabeth at the period, at the time. Um, and he's again, kind of fighting back against all of this pomp, um, saying, what are, what are the splendors of the gaudy court, these tinsel trappings and its pageant pomps? To me, Far happier seems the banished lord amid Siberia's unrejoicing wilds, who pines all lonesome in his chamber's horror of some high castle shut, those or whose windows dim and distant ken discover trackless plains where winter ever whirls his icy car, while still repeated objects of his view, the gloomy battlements and ivied spires that crown the solitary dome. So he's like envying the guy who's banished because he is free from all this luxury. And I also think that this is a, it, it relates to another sentiment of poets that luxury and success is almost always seen as the death of the poet or the, the death of good poetry. As soon as, you know, the, the good poet has to be a bit of, the, of an outsider and there's nothing worse than a pampered poet who, you know, is, it within the well ensconced within the aristocracy 
and writes with a golden quill and stuff. I mean, you 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 got to ask yourself like, what kind of sentiment is he really going to? Is this poet really going to uh, put forth, or, or are they just going to kowtow to the powerful or whatever to kind of help their position as court poet or uh, or poet laureate? Um, and I actually think Wharton was poet laureate, which is very ironic. But um, anyway, so. Uh, so he, so this banished lord in the middle of Siberia is far happier uh, than is the, the proud, oh, far happier than is the proud potent uh, satrap whom he left far behind in Moscow's golden palaces to drown in ease and luxury the laughing hours. So the banished lord's happier than the, the satrap who's pampered in Moscow in, in power. Okay. <sighs> All right, um, we're kind of running out of time. You know what, I actually thought that we might do Thomas Gray next week. Um, let me just kind of prelude Thomas Gray because it's already 6.52, um, but we'll do more of Thomas Gray next week. Uh, I think he, he deserves more, uh, more focus and I don't want to leave him out. Um, but let me look at this one. Uh, stanza here, the boast of heraldry, the pomp of power, and all that beauty, all that wealth e'er gave, awaits alike the inevitable hour, the paths of glory lead but to the grave. Um, once again, these, this is a common echo, and it echoes Ozymandias, and it echoes Parnell, um, and so Thomas Gray is well within, if you understand the, the sense here, uh, well within that tradition. And uh, as you probably already kind of, you're getting this already, uh, the sense that this particular poem is like the ultimate uh, graveyard poem um, and very famous, quoted at a lot of funerals for hundreds of years. So uh, it's quite a, an enduring sentiment. So, um, so let's just stop there. Um, I'm going to just throw the last, the last slide because we're out of time. Does anyone have any questions as we come to a close here um, about the material or maybe about their writing? If you have any specific like questions about a specific topic that you want to explore, um, maybe just uh, email me directly and we'll talk about it. I like to hear I actually really like to hear your topics beforehand, so I can kind of, just to be aware of it, but point you in the right direction if I could, nudge you, um, and, and maybe avoid things, well-trodden ground that's already been discussed ad nauseum. So if there's something that, oh, this, this is a little bit more of a undiscovered territory in terms of a topic, I might encourage you to go in that direction rather than just you know doing things that are quite, um, quite predictable or, uh, already been discussed. Any questions? I'm thinking, like, is are there any uh, like subgenres within the um, graveyard poetry genre? I mean, I know it's even the genre itself has kind of shaky borders with how it leads into romanticism. But um, when I'm right. looking, well, subgenres. Um, I think the what you just described in the in your last. Uh, phrase was right in the sense that there is not so much subgenres, sub but dovetailings with other genres. So some are more um, like Pope. He has some of this graveyard poetry sentiment in it, uh, but he's more kind of uh, loyal to the Enlightenment sense sensibilities. Uh, and then others tend to be more reactionary against the enlightenment and pro like the rom uh, romantic, uh, the revolution of romanticism, I guess, that ended up happening at the end of the 18th and the early 19th century. Um, so there's a lot of kind of odd uh, bedfellows as it were sometimes. Yeah, uh, anyone else questions? comments do you do you want us to take a stand in the paper like start out by saying i'm going to show exactly how this this particular thesis is supported um by you know 
re the research that we do or just kind of generally, um, this is the topic I want to discuss and this is what, what, what scholars have said about it. Oh, well, ideally you would, dis you would find your own uh, customized position, a unique perspective that you get from thinking about it and noticing things that people haven't noticed before you. And I know <laughs> that's hard to do when these poems are centuries old and they've been discussed by a lot of people, but ideally you would be able to, you know, take from whether it's uh, the, the uh, primary sources or research that's been done, <clears throat> commentaries um, over the last few hundred years, um, and synthesize that and say, okay, I've noticed this, this person says this, this person says that, but I say this third thing, which no one's, had, no one's ever said before. That's the, that's, the, um, that's the goal. It's hard to get to. Even like professor, professional scholars and academics uh, have a hard time getting to that point where they're, have a, they're saying something new, um, but that's the goal for your papers or for anything you do in life, <laughs> be original. <laughs> um, yeah. So you don't want to just be regurgitating stuff that you read. Anyone else? No? All right. Well, thank you so much. I enjoyed this. Uh, I hope you did. I will, I did record it this time. So I will post this quite quickly, I believe on the site if, um, well, you guys were here, but so those of you who aren't will be able to see it uh, over the next few days. So, well, thank you very much and uh, have a good, have a good week. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank bye -bye. you.